wonderful. Look at that. The stare down. These things are friggin' terrifying. I can't believe they're back out again. Good morning. This is Bill from Auto House of Naples and Curious Cars on a, you know, it's a mediocre Florida Wednesday. But here's the deal. I am not going to rant and bitch about the weather today out of courtesy uh, to the rest of the United States, which appears to be buried in some sort of a vicious winter snowstorm. I mean, when it's like negative 10 in Texas, uh, you know, they don't want to hear me bitching about what's going to be like a mid-80s day in uh, in unusually warm southern Florida. It's just not fair, so I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to cry about the horrible, you know, the missed opportunity of having chilly February weather, the kind of thing we love. I'm not going to cry about the upcoming miserable summer months of vicious, horrible heat uh, while people are buried in snow up to their a-holes in other parts of the uh, the country. It's just not fair to them. They don't want to hear me cry uh, about, uh, you know, this uh, floor. You know, it's like 72 degrees this morning, which uh, is quite nice, but of course harkens to a hotter day ahead. And uh, I know that nobody really wants me uh, crying about that. So I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Uh, what I am going to bitch about is, first of all, I've got a cat. He's heading the other way, which is good. You know, normally I don't like cats, but uh, when you're surrounded by birds around here, and even goats, I don't know if the cat will attack a goat for me, but hopefully it would. Uh, so I'm not going to cry too much about the cat either. But here's the thing. You know, I always hear in the comment section, oh, the animals, they're cute, they're sweet, they're nice. Uh, they mean you no harm, they're lovely. Okay, I want you to see this. Look at all the goat shit that is parked right around where I photograph and video the cars. Look at this. I mean, you want to talk about a severe gastrointestinal problem. Uh, it is loaded with goat shit. And you cannot tell me that this is not a targeted attack. I mean, this is the goat version of the Blair Witch Project, where they're, you know, the, the witch is leaving weird little straw figurines around to scare the crap out of people. This is what the goats are doing to me. They're not around this morning. I don't know why. I'm thankful. Uh, but they have left their calling card to remind me uh, that they could come back at any time probably when I least expect it. And uh, don't you dare tell me that this is, this is just the equivalent of the bird shit on the hood uh, that we had last week. And uh, I don't like it. I don't think it's cool. And uh, again, uh, I'm going to start, um, I'm going to start wearing my sidearm just in case those things come at me. I mean, you've got to be shitting me. Look at all of this. It's unbelievable. I mean, who knew that goats could produce that much crap? And why even have goats? Why doesn't Peter get cows? You know, another big, giant, menacing animal to come near me and stare at me while I'm doing stuff and unsettle me. Uh, you could have ocelots, you could have ostriches, emus. You know, why stop at goats? <sighs> Okay, anyway, we're going to get right into it. Uh, today I've got this bitchin' Camaro. Uh, I really, really do. And it's good that I have it because it's going to help me clear up a couple of things. Uh, this is a 1984 uh, Z28 Camaro with the all-69 option, the three, uh, 305 high-output engine. Very important engine in this car. Ran from 83 to 86. Uh, but we'll get into all that in a minute. Uh, the other day in the Aurora video, uh, what I did, mistakenly was talk about the uh, frameless glass on the sides and you know how it was kind of cool and not like a shitbox firebird well <laughs> man did I get some flack for that firebirds are not shitboxes well yes they are but okay here's the thing is my first car first car I ever owned first car in the world I'll try to track down a photo of it but I don't think I have one maybe I do I'll try I'll look for it was a 1979 formula firebird uh, it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Uh, in fact, I got it when I was still 15. I didn't have my full driver's license. It's just something that came available through a family friend. And uh, it was bought and put in the garage. So I was riding the bus, the big yellow limo to school, uh, walking past this bright GM flame red Firebird for six months, which was 
torture, absolute hell on earth, uh, to know that I had this great car in the garage and uh, was riding the bus instead. But of course, you know, as time goes on, your birthday comes. Now they come every 12 seconds, by the way. Uh, but back then it took a while. Uh, but I got my license on my birthday, quite unlike the snowflakes of today. Uh, you know, I don't get them at all, to be honest. Well, oh, maybe I'll get a license someday. I mean, what the... F Anyway, uh, I got the license and I started driving the car. So Firebirds and F-Bodies, Camaros, whatnot, but mainly even Firebirds, have a very special place in my heart. Uh, very special. Number one car. You know, give me a break. It's like your first girl, the first time, uh, you know, one, well, I shouldn't say that. But anyway, uh, the first time you got lucky in your car, you remember that girl. And uh, I also remember that car. And I also understand that Firebirds had some great stuff uh, over the years. And, uh, uh, you know, they were pretty good cars in many, many ways. But the build quality was shit. And that's what I'm talking about. I mean, even on this car, you drive it 135 down the interstate, which we're not not going to do, uh, the side windows are going to pop out. You know, that's not going to happen even in like a Porsche 944, never mind the 928 that this car theoretically competed with. Uh, the build quality on these F bodies has always been a little bit substandard. And that's fine because to me it's part of their charm. Uh, but I feel like I am well entitled uh, to call a Firebird a shitbox because of my undying, everlasting love for them. Uh, so, uh, you know, if any of the people who took me out for that are still watching, which I doubt, uh, just know that uh, I'm more with you than you think. I absolutely love these cars. And speaking of it, let's get into this. So this is a third generation F-Body, the F-Body being the uh, Camaro Firebird of the time. Uh, the first generation was a pretty interesting car. Of course, it's the most collectible now, the most sought after. And, uh, but here's the thing about it. It was a response to the Ford Mustang. That's what it was. Uh, the Mustang came out in 64 and a half. It started selling very well. It invented the whole pony car genre, and GM had to respond. And they responded with the Camaro, which was quite a weird name that nobody really understood. Uh, there was some weird story about how it was taken from a French dictionary, uh, and uh, it meant uh, comrade or friend or buddy, but uh, Camaro really doesn't exist in France. So uh, nobody, yeah, yeah, maybe somebody really knows where the name came from from, but their cover story was crap and made no sense at all. Uh, but it was a response, and even if it did quite well, uh, became a pony car, even a muscle car in some incarnations, and uh, went on to sell very well. It was still a response to the Mustang. Uh, then the second Gen F body got off to a fantastic start. Beautiful car, lovely design, uh, you know, gorgeous to look at, uh, but came right at the time when all of the misery was about to start. The emissions standards, the gas crunch, the uh, Arab oil embargo, uh, you know, all of the 70s crap that really drove everybody up the wall, disco, uh, the Bee Gees, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, it just, you know, there were some good cars that came in the mix, uh, you know, the 74 Super Duty 455, the, you know, kudos to GM for, uh, or Chevy for keeping the Z28 going 78 and uh, 79, uh, and uh, the WS6 Trans Am which came out in, I don't know, maybe 77, but definitely 78 and 79, uh, was probably the definitive American road handling sports muscle car of the time. It handled very well. You remember Smokey and the Bandit and that sort of thing, all the CB stuff. And uh, to me, again, as a Firebird guy, that was the pinnacle. That's the car I wanted. Uh, my uh, formula was not a WS6, did not have the rear disc brakes and the wide wheels and that sort of thing, but I still loved the damn thing. And I got in a lot of trouble in that car uh, and uh, did a, a lot of brake burns and other terrible things that uh, kids do. Uh, speaking of which, Peter's kid, nice young guy, got his first speeding ticket last week. I feel very sentimental for him. Uh, I once he was like a 70 and a 45. I mean, we've been telling him for like three, four, slow down, man. It's gonna, They're going to get, no, I can I keep an eye out for him. They're not going to get, well, they got him. And uh, God knows bad things are going to ensue. I had like 11 tickets one year when I was 17. 
the cops knew me by name. Naples is not a big place, so uh, you drive a bright red Firebird at 16, uh, you know, with big scoops on the hood and, uh, you know, loud exhaust, you get to be known. And, yeah, they almost got my license, but not quite, hung on by a thread. Uh, at some point, they actually slowed me down, and uh, the rest is history. But anyway, where the hell was I? Off on these tangents, I always forget where I came from. The third generation Camaro is extremely important. And I'm gonna say this, this car was a victim of its own success an absolute victim of its own success. Because it was so wildly popular and successful during its day, because they made so many of them, it became less than it should be. Uh, for one thing, when this car came out in 1982, the engine was a little bit anemic then. It had that crossfire, ceasefire V8 fuel injection thing that uh, really wasn't that great. I think it had like 168 horsepower, uh, 165. You couldn't get it with a manual gearbox, uh, only the uh, uh, three-speed automatic. Uh, you could get a lesser version of the 305 with the five-speed, but that was uh, fuel and not fuel engine. It was carbureted with uh, like a 145 horsepower and the Mustang ended up kicking its ass. Now you have to remember that this was morning in America. I mean gone were the Carter malaise days. Uh, you know the things were starting to pick up. Uh, car companies were starting to understand how to make emissions and all that other stupid crap work with horsepower and uh, you know gone were the 110 horsepower 1200 cubic inch engines of the late 70s and the horsepower ratings were starting to edge upward. Uh, the Mustang ended up with like 165 uh, out of the 302 in 1983, uh, or sorry, 82, and the Camaro, you know, had about the same, or 145 with the stick. So Chevy needed to do something because everybody loved the handling of the Camaro. I mean, the, the body style, first of all, was groundbreaking. It was gorgeous, a complete departure, nothing like the prior generation F bodies. Uh, very almost European sports car in nature. This raked, raked windshield to 62 degrees, by the way, which broke an internal GM rule of limiting it to 60 degrees. Uh, this very complex back glass, which GM uh, called the most complex back window in General Motors history. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what they called it. And, uh, you know, it was down in the front, up in the rear, uh, rocker panel side effects, stripes, uh, you know, at the time, white letter tires, and it looked cool as hell, and people went nuts for it. And then in 1983, General Motors needed more horsepower, and they got it. They built a specially prepped uh, Camaro for, I want to call it the Heath Ledger. There are the goats. I didn't even see them, and they snuck up on me. There they are, taking out Peter's bushes. There's little bastards. There's Cujo in the middle. He's going to come at me any minute. And we're going to keep an eye on these things. You know, the minute he takes off, they come out. They were hot. Look at that thing. Look at it. Yeah, they can get up high like that. Oh, geez, I'm missing it with the camera. Um, uh, we're going to keep an eye on these. Uh, they're, both of them are up in the air now. <sighs> Where's the cat when I need it? Why doesn't the cat throw itself at these things like a spider monkey and send them running? If I had a cat, that's what it would do. I hope they just stay over there. So this is now completely discombobulated. I'm lost and I don't remember where the hell I was. I almost have to stop and keep going. Uh, but anyway, okay, so I call it the, the Heath Ledger 24, uh, which was at some sort of Northeast Ohio race. It's not. It's the Northern Ledges or the something Ledges racetrack. I can't remember. Anyway, it was kind of a famous SCCA endurance race that uh, went on for a while. I think it's back again. Uh, they've, uh, they've started running it. But um, Chevy prepped an engine for it, and uh, they, it, it was, you know, a, the cam from the Corvette, uh, different exhaust, different intake, four-barrel carb, and they then out, Rouse, 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 go on, Rouse, Rouse. God, they're not scared at all. Go on, get out of here, stop, and stop with your shitting on the yard. I've already stepped in it. 
anyway, Chevy prepped an engine for that race, and uh, they went on to make a production version of it called the L69. And that was the infusion of power that this Camaro needed uh, to absolutely take out the Mustang and become the number one sports coupe in America from 1983 onward. Uh, it was a very big deal, and it was pretty cool at the time. And uh, that's how this thing was equipped. Boosted the horsepower. All, listen to them with that blood curdling noise. No, I have no interest in you. None at all. None. Rouse. Be gone. The goat roast. Um, God, and it just flusters me, and then I don't know where the hell I was at. Anyway, the L69 engine, which came out in 83. In 83, you could only get it with the five-speed, the Borg Warner five-speed, which was great uh, transmission, which was also new for 83. Uh, Oh my God, stop it, stop it. Nobody has any interest in this, I promise you. No, no, I, am, I have no food, I have no goat food, nothing, nothing. Thank God they're hightailing it. All right, anyway, where the hell was I? I? You know, this has just become ridiculous. I have got to find a new place where there aren't goats or cows or tigers or rhinos or whatever the hell else he has running around here. Anyway, so 83 was a big performance upgrade from the uh, Camaro. Gone was that ceasefire injection, uh, detuned Corvette thing. Uh, in was 165 horse 305, and then this, the L69, 190 horsepower 305, uh, which by 84 you could get with a 700 R4 four-speed tranny, or... Uh, transmission or uh, the uh, Borg Warner T5. And the horsepower wars, the Camaro Mustang wars were back. I mean, they were sort of disappeared in the 70s. Mustang went insane in the 70s. I mean, it was absolute crap. There's text now. Turn off this stupid phone so that doesn't happen 50 times. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, after the malaise of the 70s, uh, Camaro and Mustang were back at it and the winner was the American public. And that's pretty cool stuff. So, uh, 1984, 190 horsepower, five-speed manual or four-speed automatic. Uh, and uh, the car didn't just go quick. I mean, again, 190 horsepower doesn't sound like much today, but you've got to remember that we're talking about an era where they had 460s from Ford in 1979 that put out about 90 horsepower. I mean, it was ridiculous. In 82, this car's max horsepower was 165. Uh, you could also get it with an Iron Duke, you know, that old uh, the yeah, bulletproof Pontiac four-cylinder that put out 90 horsepower. Had to be the world's slowest Camaro. Uh, but, uh, you know, horsepower was was not as much of a thing. So I would almost call this car in 1983, guys, uh, the restoration of the American horsepower wars. It really was. It was, the, you know, now you get in a Cadillac CTSV that has 12,000 horsepower. Your average Camaro Firebird has 600 horsepower. Uh, there's even a horsepower battle between the V6 Camaros and Mustangs right now. All of that could probably trace its roots back uh, to this early uh, third generation F body, and that's pretty neat stuff. 190 horsepower was back on track for uh, for GM, Chevrolet, and uh, the American people. Uh, you know, in the early 80s, you had people starting to listen to heavy metal music again. They were banging their heads. Uh, disco was gone. Uh, Motley Crue was in, and uh, they wanted a car to match it. And this thing hit it at exactly the right time. Uh, in fact, it kind of flip flop positions with the Firebird, the Trans Am of the time. Uh, in the late 70s, the Trans Am had it. It had the look, it had the style, it had the power and the handling, and the Z28 was truly in second place. Uh, Camaro Firebird had a version of this F-Body. You remember Knight Rider, kind of hard to forget. Uh, but it just didn't live up to the same performance potential that the Z28 did. It had a smaller rear sway bar. Uh, it had a little bit of a thicker front one, but it didn't matter. The Z28 handled a lot better. And that was the big deal about this car. For the first time, truly, GM wasn't responding to other cars with the Camaro. It kicked other cars' asses right out of the box. I mean, 
absolutely no comparison uh, between the handling of this car and the handling of the Mustang. There was also that Daytona Turbo Z from uh, Chrysler, uh, which, you know, people pretended was great, but truly was just a front drive four-cylinder turd compared to the Camaro. And people went nuts for this car, and they bought it by the shitload. In 84, they sold over 100,000 Camaros, uh, with 50,000 of them uh, being Z28 models. So uh, this, this is why I say this car is, I mean, everybody at the time said this car was drop-dead gorgeous. Uh, the problem, and the only problem, was that there was one on every street corner. You know, it just was, I mean, if it had been as rare as a Ferrari, uh, you probably could have charged three times as much for it. The car is beautiful, uh, with the four square lights up front that kind of harken to earlier muscle cars, but uh, otherwise look very modern. The ground effects on the bottom in silver with the Z28 badges and contrasting colors, the raked windshield, uh, the uh, spoiler at the back. Uh, the fender flares out the side, the twin, uh, you know, in the early versions, those uh, hood scoops were functional with the crossfire injection. By the time this car rolled around, they weren't, but uh, it still looked friggin' awesome and still does today. Uh, and I just think these cars were treated very, very unfairly because of how many there are. I mean, just stop it with the mullet jokes. <laughs> I mean, I get it. You know, there was a time when these things uh, were the, uh, the kings of the trailer park. And, uh, you know, only now are they starting to emerge from that and become genuine collectibles. Of course, a lot of them have become turds. Uh, a lot of them got beat to crap and thrown away. And uh, the truly nice ones are now a little more rare and starting to pull real money. So, uh, anyway, I was talking about the Trans Am, which didn't live up to it. The Camaro took it. And here's what I, here's what I want to get to. Uh, there is a famous, and I, I think I'll try to link to this in the description of this video. Uh, in 1983, Motor Week uh, did a comparison and face-off between the 1983 Porsche 928S and the uh, Camaro Z28. Uh, which was ludicrous at face value because the Porsche then cost $45,000 and was the fastest road car in the United States, production car. Uh, the Camaro cost $13,000 and, uh, you know, was new and exciting and whatnot, but nowhere near the same amount of technological advancement. You've got four-wheel independent suspension out of the 928. Uh, you've got uh, an aluminum 4.7 liter V8. Uh, the thing was very, very advanced for the time, over $100,000 in today dollars. Uh, it was a pretty amazing car and, and the king of the GT class. So here along comes this Camaro and uh, they run them against each other. I can't remember the name of the uh, racetrack, but it's in West Virginia. Uh, here's the thing, the Camaro got a faster time. The Porsche came in at 140 around the uh, one minute 40 seconds around a two mile course. The Camaro came in at a little over 138. Uh, at that particular day, at that particular track, uh, the Z28 beat the Porsche. And that tells you just how cool this car was at the time. This is why people went nuts for it. This is why it was Motor Trend's car of the year and Car and Driver called it the best handling American car that they'd ever tested. Uh, it was. I mean, it used the same stuff basically as earlier F-bodies, a solid rear axle. Uh, but up front it had coil springs. Uh, in the back it had coil springs and arms instead of leaf springs. Uh, big roll bars uh, and lots and lots of suspension tweaking. It pulled like 0 .82, 0 .83 on the skid pad with those 15-inch Eagle GT tires, which were great for the time, but shit today. This car handled. Uh, it was a fun car to throw around a racetrack, and uh, that was a tremendous departure for uh, GM and the rebirth of the F-Body in a way that it hadn't been seen before, and kudos to them for that. So, I do spend a lot of time on this channel beating the shit out of GM, and I am a GM guy, by the way, much more than Ford or anyone else. Uh, but, uh, you know, instead of talking about where GM got it wrong, uh, this time we're talking about where GM got it right. And the third gen Camaro is uh, 
is it. Now this one, somebody upgraded the wheels. I was going to change them back after I got the car. There's that cat running. Hopefully he's getting the goats. Uh, this would have had 15 inch uh, dished. Uh, very similar looking wheels, but not quite like these. These are 16 inch wheels off an IROC Z, uh, which came out the next year. Uh, I'm not going to get into the whole IROC thing, the International Race of Champions. Someday soon I'll have an IROC and we'll get into it then. Uh, but that uh, IROC name dominated the Z28 from 1985 through, oh God, I don't know, 1989 or 90. And uh, it kind of has become a cultural icon of sorts. Uh, I, I won't get into what, you know, the acronym stands for for some people but uh, uh, anyway so somebody put IROC rims on this thing 16 inch would have had gator backs in the day and I left it because not only does it I think look a little bit more modern and better and still uh, basically enhance the uh, appearance of the car in an original sort of way it's also a modification someone would have done at the time you know a lot of these cars got drag raced guys bought them they put big center line wheels on them uh, pulled off the original wheels so uh, some guy who had this 84 Z28 at the time could easily have come up with a set of IROC wheels and stuffed them on and uh, so it was fine with me. If it had anything modern on there I would have killed him. Anyway, let's just get into this car. Thank God the goats are gone. I'll try not to walk in their shit. Alright, so I'm going to release the back hatch here. And again, that is a big giant bunch of curvature, huge rear window, which by the way didn't help the uh, temperature inside the car on a hot day. Uh, they had to put a hypo, uh, not just V8 in the car, but air conditioning system in the car to keep it cool. So, um, you know, it's neat, but at the same time, eh, that's in a lot of heat. Uh, but this was again a departure. I mean, the last gen Camaro had this very cool little back window, but it was functionless and had a little stubby trunk you couldn't fit much in. Uh, this thing has a big giant hatchback area and a rear seat that folds forward uh, for even more cargo. And of course, back in the day in high school, a lot of the kids I knew put big woofers in the back of this thing. <clears throat> now, I left all this stuff in here. Uh, this is an original set of, uh, well, I don't know if it's original, I'm sure it's actually reproduction, set of stripes for the side of the car. Uh, the stripes that are on this car are quite nice, uh, but they're, uh, you know, a little bit age-worn from time. Uh, I guess when the time came, the guy was going to put on new stripes which are sitting here. That's a new air cleaner decal. Uh, this is a pretty cool uh, original magazine ad uh, with this particular car. Now I've screwed up. Let's see if I can feed it back in there one-handed. I can. Nice. Uh, and uh, that is uh, the dealership uh, uh, promo and then this nice big giant, I mean giant, uh, service manual for 1984 Camaros which uh, give you all the information you need to keep the car in tip-top shape. Uh, I love the square taillights. Uh, they change those later on. I like the ones with the little squares in them. And uh, this is funny. Uh, you had a flip-down license plate, you know, where normally you'd want fuel, uh, but it only has the uh, <clears throat> key for the uh, trunk release. Not sure why that happened. The fuel door's on the side. Maybe they changed their minds. Uh, you don't have a glove box, so they give you this lockable compartment here. I don't think there's anything in there, but we may as well check. The 80s, I don't know what you would have put in here. Little bags of Coke, maybe. Yeah, nothing in there. And then over there, under this thing, is all the spare tire stuff. And you have little uh, grappling things there to strap your infants down if you have to carry any with you. Uh, but this gave the car a very nice utility. Uh, you know, you've got the uh, the deep place here. That's another I could act as a little playpen for kids, actually, especially if you could get a net over the top of it. Uh, but uh, you've got that depth there. You've got this depth there. It becomes a fantastic grocery getter. And I love the three-piece rear spoiler. Very, very cool. Have a look under the hood. Uh, this one did come with T-tops, which, you know, if you're looking for a handling car, uh, you probably want the full tin roof so it doesn't flex as much, but uh, if you're looking for a cruiser, uh, T-tops are the way to go. Uh, since I wouldn't be racing this car, I, they're, now they're in front of me. Now they're trying to outflank me from the front, and they're going to put more shit down on the ground. Look at the horns on that tan one. They're glinting off the point, razor sharp. I, I just can't believe it. I don't know how we were able to do like 40 videos here without seeing the goats. Now they're out all the time, every day. Every day. Would you eat everything out back? 
monsters. Let's have a look under here. All right, so here it is. Here is the L69 5 liter high output 305 with 190 horsepower. You see the dual snorkel intake, that added some horsepower, uh, gets sucked in over the top of the headlights, which is very cool. Uh, you've got um, uh, basically a cast iron block pushrod V8, you know, could be out of a 60s model, but it's just been very nicely tweaked uh, to meet federal emission standards, while at the same time, and here's another thing I love from this vintage. Ford and Chevy said it both. Uh, guys like to work on their own cars, so we're not going to load them up with electronics to uh, get in the way of that. We're you know, going to leave them as accessible as we can, so if you want to put fancy intakes and carbs and headers and all this stuff, you can. Wow! God, if only car companies thought that way today, would we be in a better world? I mean, you, you basically open the uh, hood of a modern car and it's like, you know, an Apple IIe under the hood. You, you have no idea what's going on there. This thing is much more accessible to the guy who likes to work in his own car. And uh, that's why I think they're going to keep climbing up the collectible market. Uh, guys can actually maintain these cars themselves. Uh, but anyway, this was a sea change uh, in the uh, horsepower wars. Finally, a tick upward instead of downward, and a uh, terrific uh, engine overall. And later on, would get replaced by that uh, tune port injection 305, which was also a great motor, and uh, then the uh, 350, the 57 tune port, uh, and then on to the LT1 and the LT3 and the LT5 and the LS and whatever the the continuation of that pushrod V8. Uh, but uh, to me, this one was the one that started it back. Uh, that after a decade of horrible malaise and high cubic inch shitty horsepower ratings uh, GM and Ford and yeah, Chrysler not so much started to turn it around and make uh, horsepower great again very very cool stuff like the little bullet uh, mirrors. Again, love the ground effects on the car with the contrasting striping, the five-spoke wheels, which, yeah, look close enough to the originals to... No, no! No, out! Out, out! God, I'm going to have to find a way to look more menacing. Uh, a very nice gentleman sent me a, uh, a DVD the other day. Uh, I got it in the mail. I'm, I'm replying... <laughs> <laughs> right? Some movie, I had no idea it existed, called The Men Who Stare at Goats. And thank you for sending it. It's very kind. I appreciate it. Uh, apparently, in that movie, and I haven't watched it yet, uh, there's some way that you can kill goats by looking at them. So I promise you, tonight, I'm going to be studying that movie. Studying it hard. Uh, but anyway, again, dippy front, long, stubby tail, big C pillar, lovely big uh, back glass. The styling of this car was an absolute departure for GM. It was gorgeous. It was appreciated at the time. Because of it, they, that blood curdling sound, they sold a ton of them. And because they sold a ton of them and because they were so common, uh, they're not appreciated the, the way they should be today. You hear about the moment. No, what is going on? Out, out, out. I mean, do you think I changed my mind in the last 15 seconds? I have no food on me. I'm probably looking for flesh. Anyway, let's just get inside the car. God's sake, before they really attack me. Uh, not quite dual exhaust on the car yet. Twin tips at the back. Uh, but uh, it was... Uh, uh, two into the high flow cat and uh, back into a dual outlet muffler and then two pipes at the back and sounded very racy. Uh, the guy who owned this one put on some kind of a turbo muffler so it sounds even more racy. Um, yeah, you know, it's fine. It's probably not what I would do. I kind of like the stock sound which is, you know, a little more quiet but uh, I think most people prefer the rumble that this car has. Got my uh, keys out. Frameless glass. Now, this car has two options, which I really love. Uh, number one is this Camaro logo interior uh, with the orange and the triple Camaro. That Chevy orange, Hugger orange, famous Chevy color. Uh, you know, triple Camaro down the door panels, uh, Camaro seats, Camaro back seats. There is going to be no question uh, what type of car. I mean, none of your passengers are going to get in and go, is this a Mustang? You know, they are going to know instantly what they're getting into. 
Uh, also, this car had the Contour uh, front seats. Now, because of a supply issue at the time, uh, it only had uh, one seat that was Contour. The passenger seat was not. Uh, but you see it's power adjusted, and you see it's got these little side bolster adjusters and uh, 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 you know, bottom bolster adjust. Now that helped with the handling. That helped, you know, the Mustang at the time handled worse and had horrible seats that made you spend more time trying to stay in the car than drive the car. The Camaro, uh, especially with this contour seat, uh, held you in much tighter and aided with its uh, handling because you were firmly ensconced in the car. Uh, you also had rear seats, a place where your Canadians, I cannot say that they're going to be chipper back there. Uh, it's tight. There's not a lot of headroom and uh, you know the hell with them they're your backseat passengers so uh, they can suck it but uh, back they are there you've got uh, your four seats uh, you're really not going to consummate any kind of a relationship in the back uh, you're way better off sticking to the front seats even with the big center console uh, the dashboard very very sporty for the time big overhang on the top that kind of shades the instruments and uh, goes in kind of neat and unusual uh, full gauges and uh, I love the uh, Z28 logo there in the passenger side with the high output script neat stuff uh, all very modern for the time and uh, you know the car was lighter than the prior generation F body same size but lighter I will hop in three-spoke steering wheel a fascinating set of gauges for one thing you've got the speedometer slash uh, well, it's all a speedometer, but you've got miles and kilometers on some sort of a dual swinging needle, uh, which was a very sort of bizarre and complex uh, answer to the, uh, you know, North American, Canada, U.S. thing, how we'd have kilometers and uh, miles per hour on the same gauge. Uh, most companies just put an inner gauge of... Uh, of, you know, the kilometers inside. Not Chevy. They did this weird... I guess they wanted it to look like aircraft instruments or something, and that was part of the style. And I can appreciate that. Uh, you also have a temp gauge. You've got a fuel gauge. You've got a uh, voltmeter. And uh, then your... Uh, uh, 5500 red line tack uh, over here you've got a cigarette lighter because people did smoke in the 80s although I don't think this guy smoked much rear defrost very basic climate control and then a uh, Delco radio which unfortunately in this car does not seem to be working I'm gonna pull it out and see if I can get it going but it really pisses me off I want to listen to some Motley Crue this morning uh, then you got this big center console with the cocaine clock from the 80s you can see it's even got a few razor marks in it still works which is pretty cool and uh, just a neat feature on that car uh, and again no glove box you had to go in here uh, there's your I don't know, whatever the hell you call it um, uh, your owner's manual and I'll zoom in on this for a minute somebody wants to pause it you can see the equipment this car came with the old sheet is under there there we go and of course the uh, leather wrapped e-brake so anyway let's fire this thing up Leave the door open so you can hear it. All right, there is the sound of that uh, high output 305. Uh, again, more of a um, more of a sound than I would put in my car, but you know, still has a nice, nice rumble to it. If that's your thing. Definitely would have been my thing back in the day. Uh, you got your cruise control and wipers on one stalk. You got your uh, tilt wheel here, which I'm going to take advantage of. And uh, your rear defrost. You know, very, very simple. Uh, windows, hatch open. Uh, it's just, you know, it's all that you need. Um, T-tops up there, which I could remove. I think that's pretty cool. Doesn't have shades, but yeah, there they are. Uh, very simple mirror. And actually, before I go anywhere, I'm going to put all my crap back in the uh, the rear so I don't have to come back. So let me pause there for a minute, and we'll, uh, we'll come back and drive it. All right, license plate is on, stuff in the back, goats are behind us, and uh, off we go. Um, and what a nice menacing growl out of those 305 cubic inches. You know, 190 horsepower today is like base Camry four-cylinder horsepower, but uh, the world is different. And 190 back then, this was the king of the heap. In fact, this uh, HO uh, five-speed version uh, would beat the shit out of a uh, automatic Corvette at the time, which was supposed to be a much quicker car. 
uh, but wasn't. Uh, the Z28 really kind of ate into the Corvette's numbers because for half the price, or you know maybe a little more than that, uh, you could have a car that handled and performed quite nearly as well as the Corvette. You gotta hand it, man. You really do it at GM. I mean, uh, you know, this car was the full package. It wasn't just horsepower. Uh, it had uh, the handling to boot. And uh, that was, again, something new from GM. Uh, I love the way it sounds. And it's true. It's got a recirculating ball steering, which is nice and responsive. The Mustang had a really shitty rack and pinion at the time uh, that um, uh, had terrible road fuel. The Camaro's is pretty good. Uh, again, maybe not by today's standards, but certainly at the time. And going around the racetrack, you could uh, modulate the understeer with the throttle. You could kick the corners out, uh, the tail out in the corners. Uh, you could really drive this thing at a great clip. Uh, it was a true Grand Touring car. And lest we forget, a true Grand Touring car that could turn in a faster time around the racetrack uh, than the Porsche 928S, a car that cost three times as much uh, at the time. And that's why, that's, you know, it's, <laughs> GM can't win. They finally built a great, great Z28, and they saw so many of the damn things that they become a bit of a cliche. Uh, it's just one of those poor things with GM. They, they just always run into issues of some kind or another. Uh, the cars are either too good for what they are or not good enough for what they promise to be. So going down the straight road, yeah, whatever, you know, get into the gas a little bit, nice pep. Um, you know, if we had some twisty turns, it'd be fun to throw it around. I notice a lot of guys still road race these cars. You go to the SCCA, uh, there's still a bunch in the GT classes and, uh, you know, the vintage classes because they're really, really fun to drive. Uh, Volvo SUV, the antithesis of this car. A little bit of wheel spin. The smell of burned rubber brings me back to my youth. Uh, and again, it's not a rocket ship. It doesn't throw your head back or anything. Uh, but man, does it have torque. It's got torque, and the torque feels nice. Torque is good. Uh, you know, certainly enough to uh, chirp second gear, to break the tires loose, to have a bit of fun with it. Uh, the Mustang at the time, it really didn't handle. It was just a donut machine. Uh, where you could just light up the tires all the time. But this C28 was a much more complete car. Really, really was. You got all the fun stuff with the horsepower and the torque and the parking lot donuts, but you could also fling it around a racetrack as well and uh, handle on a world-class level. So, oh boy, there it is. Uh, in 1984, Chevrolet Camaro Z28, really, really sweet car. This one has just 38,000 miles. It's been babied and well kept over the years. You know, for it to look like this, not perfect, but very, very good. Uh, you know, these things didn't last very well past 100,000 miles unless they were incredibly pampered. Uh, you know, a normally driven car uh, really got beat to crap, and most of them did, and that's why very few of these nice ones are still remaining. And I think it's a great car to speculate on, collector-wise. I think they're still underperforming. I think it can still be bought uh, reasonably. And it was such a cool and important car from the 80s that I think it's only going to keep going up in value. I'm going to be waiting forever to turn right up here, so I won't bore you. Uh, this one will be available at uh, uh, Auto House of Naples on the web at uh, autohousenaples.com, uh, or you can give the guys a call at 239-263-8500. Uh, really appreciate you having a look today. We're going to try and come up with something else. I missed out on that XJR. It sold before I could do a video. Really pissed me off. That was going to be a neat car. But, uh, you know, the rule of uh, the car business is never drive a sold one. That's the time a pickup truck's going to plow into your side. So, don't do it. Um, anyway, we'll come up with something fun. I have an auction this weekend, another auction next weekend. Uh, try to pick up some more neat stuff to do. I'm trying to come together with a guy who has a pretty cool collection to do some videos on his car. 
and uh, we're going to try and do some fun newer stuff from that uh, KB Auto Collection, uh, Clemens the German, you know, some kind of a neat G-Wagon or something. So um, anyway, more fun stuff to come, really appreciate you having a look, love the comments, no I haven't been answering them lately, but uh, god damn this is a busy time of year. Oh, go on then, don't pussyfoot it, I'm letting you in, go on! Oh, the hell with you. Um, Alright, thanks again, we'll see you with the next one. Take care. Mustang SUV, presumably. What is the world coming to? I mean, honestly, honestly, ridiculous.